friends, it's Morgan and Sherry Snyder, and we want to welcome you back to another episode of the Wild at Heart podcast. We're about to dive into a series that's really exciting, very intriguing, very hopeful. I want to start with a story. So a couple months ago, my good friend Brad was in a meeting. We were in a big circle, and we were just doing updates. And he stood up. And he did one of the most awkward and beautiful dances I'd ever seen this guy do. He's a funky chicken, man. And he was just smiling and there were tears in his eyes before he said a word. I I knew why he was dancing. I knew he was going to have his first grandkid. And I just started crying. And I'm even emotional now thinking of that moment. He's not a good dancer. And I think that's what made it so beautiful. He was so filled with joy. We were so filled with joy. He's been waiting for a grandchild. And I had so much joy for him. But more than that, I think where my heart went was, what's it like for a child to be born into a world of love? A world that's literally waiting for their arrival a world that's turning towards them with gaze, with affection, with preparation, with delight. I was thinking, Sherry, when I was looking at Brad, I just thought, what would it be like to be his grandson, to have this care directed his way? And with that idea, um, we want to turn to this next podcast series. You know, at Wild at Heart, we explore these big ideas of how do we heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. In other words, how do we partner with God with what Jesus declared as his primary mission, allowing it to happen in us first and then through us? At Wild Heart, we talk about, we have this tagline, love God, live free. And it's our heartbeat. It's who we want to become. But the question is, how do we get there? What is the process and what is the path and what are the tools that allow us to become the kind of person that actually finds ourselves loving God, that actually finds ourselves living free, that actually becomes the kind of person that is healed, that's freed from captivity and is well in the center of our being. And so with that in mind, Sherry, can you give us a bit of an introduction to this series? Sure, Morgan. So first, a disclaimer, Morgan and I, we are not experts on attachment. We are not neuroscientists, we're not theologians, but we are disciples of Jesus. And we, like you, like our allies have been crying out, you know, for example, like the psalmist in Psalm 25, Jesus, guide me in your truth and lead me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. So we've been pouring out our hearts to God, asking for what is the provision for the um, recovery of our hearts, the redemption of our human personhood so that we could love God and live free. So just that disclaimer. So Morgan and I are coming to this concept of secure attachment to God. And what we mean by secure attachment to God means that the little power pack of our bodies that God has designed to attach to that which gives us pleasure and feeds us and gives us peace and calm, that we have these uh, this incredible attachment system. And one could say that from a, a neurological perspective, our system of attachment is the strongest motivator of the human person. So when our system of attachment is connected in healthy relationship to other humans, to nature, and ultimately to God, then our whole body and our energies are naturally inclined in that direction. Conversely, when our bodies have unhealthy attachment or misattachment, for example, um, in my story, I have often been attached to um, validation from other people in an unhealthy way. And so when my little pleasure centers and my peace centers are attached to that, that means that when I'm receiving validation— It feels like life and joy and peace and energy. And when I'm not receiving validation, my body literally feels, it feels like death. Like I just want to die. We were meant 
to be attached to God and to other healthy humans in um, a community of redemptive love, a, the beloved community. And you could say, really, sin is the in, in its essence is misattachment. Sin in us is being attached to things or unhealthy dynamics in ourselves, in others, in the world, rather than being attached to God. So for example, if my attachment is to money, I am going to seek after money. Like the psalmist in Psalm 63, you know, God, I I long for you. My whole body aches for you. I long for money. My whole body aches for it. Or I long for the high of a different drug. My whole body longs for it. So how do we take that amazing gift of a center of attachment and attach it to God? Yeah, Sherry, it's really helpful. I think in another way of coming at it is we're trying to recover design, right? As you're saying that, what you're demonstrating is there is a way things work, right? And the scriptures are a revelation of reality. So they're recovering the true model of the way things work. I often say in Become Good Soil, desire reveals design and design reveals destiny. And so as we talk about attachment, fundamentally, the the root of healthy attachment is centered in the parent-child bond. So in all of these levels and layers of attachment, what we want to recover is this idea of the health or lack of health in a parent-child bond. You know, it's been said that the, that attachment is the quality or the strength of that bond, the ways in which it forms and develops, and then how it can be damaged and how it can be repaired. And that's the hope of the gospel, is that fundamentally one of the major lenses through which we can interpret the work of God is a work of reparenting. Right? The hopefulness of the gospel is that God actually comes to reparent the soul in places that need repair work. And so earlier we were talking about Psalm 17 as an example of just an on-ramp to this. Like, what, it, what does it feel like? What does it look like? How does um, attachment manifest itself? Right? When Psalm 17 says, keep me as an apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. As for me, I will be vindicated and I will see your face. When I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. So let's talk about this for a minute. Share like an example of this delight, the apple of your eye, right? Fundamentally, you experience attachment when you feel Mm -hmm. accepted, worthy of love and belonging, simply because you exist. It's not an earned belonging. What's an example of that? Like, where do you see that manifest? Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, the way I would say it is that um, what attachment, healthy attachment, and as as you said, it was meant to be configured in our parent-child bond. And healthy attachment captures two experiences in the body. It captures immense pleasure or mm-hmm. joy, which neurologically could be defined as this experience of glad to be with you. And it's when the parent or the caregiver reflects through a radiant face, a delighted face, that face you glimpsed in Brad, to the child, I am so glad to be with you. I am so excited that you exist. The child experiences so much pleasure and joy, the joy of glad to be with you in their body. So you're saying the actual root of joy is the experience of attachment, which kind of can feel like glad to be with you. Yeah, exactly. It's a joy for a child is experienced through that engagement of a caregiver communicating, I'm so glad to be with you. That fires up the child's pleasure centers and they're just basking in all of the um, fabulous neurotransmitters and everything that would feel good in their body. Secondly, there's an energy when it comes to attachment and it's quiet together. So you'll notice a child has a capacity for engagement and glad to be with you. And then a child is meant to rhythm and then quiet together. I'm going to just hold you and rock you, and you're going to just rest. So these two energies of a high energy, glad to be with you, and a a peaceful energy. So the child's center of rest and the child's center of energetic, glad to be with you, gladness, are um, adhered to the parent. And the parent 
effectively unlocks those faculties and attaches them to a person in a relationship. And so when I was, what I was opening with is this idea that we are going to have to manage our attachment centers our entire life. And, you know, even if we had relatively secure attachment as a child, as an adult, we still have to be navigating what am I attaching to for pleasure and for peace? What am I attaching to? What am I attaching to? And so what happens is a lot of times because of our human condition, we misattach to things that that bring harm to us or harm to others. But it's so intense, Morgan, the attachment, so that if we end up misattached, you know, when Paul says, like, the thing that I want to do, I do not do, and the thing I don't want to do, I do. He's describing that that human experience of our misattachment. The mm-hmm. energy center of my body is heading in a direction that it's misattached to instead of toward God, toward healthy relationship with others. And so how do we let Jesus redeem our attachment center? And like you said, it's um, we can receive it through being reparented by God. Since the, the, fir- the, the first um, layer of attachment was meant to be with a healthy caregiver, we can come back and um, be re- reparented by God. Sherry, what I find really interesting about what you just shared is it relates directly to Isaiah 66. When Isaiah is the prophetic message of what will happen when Christ comes, right? The revelation light of Christ, the effect in our lives, that is to say, in our body, soul, spirit, heart, mind, and will. And it says in the message translation that the effect of Christ's coming is that newborns will be satisfied as they are nurtured by a breast, they will delight themselves and they will be, they will drink their fill, right? It says they will literally be satisfied. They will be comforted. Isaiah goes on to say, I will pour robust well-being into her like a river, the glory of nations like a river in flood. You'll nurse at the breast, nestle at her bosom, bounce on her knee as a mother comforts her child so I will comfort you. Yes. And then what's so beautiful about this passage, Sherry, is the fruit. What is the fruit? What happens? In the next verse, it says, here's what will happen to the soul of that person. They will see all this. They will burst with joy. They will feel 10 feet tall. Yes. And here's what's key, is it becomes apparent that God is on your side and God is against your enemies. So what I what I so appreciate about this is, we're not just talking about psychological theory or just neuroscience. We're actually talking about the, the universe in which exactly. God created. He's wired us yes. for attachment. Yes. And as I hear you describing it, we develop insecure attachment because we attach to things that aren't meant to be the source of life. Correct. And there's damage because of places we've lacked healthy mm-hmm. attachment. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, there is a path and an invitation to mm-hmm. return to God as the primary place of attachment. So Morgan, if we go back to, you know, how does a a child from zero to three, what's what's going on developmentally? How did God wire a, an infant? And what we find, and as you said, it's 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 the lens that the scripture already gives us. Neuroscience just corroborates right. what the reality that God already self-revealed through the scripture. So an infant's only task is to receive unmerited delight, unmerited care. An infant's job is simply and only to receive, to receive care, to receive love, to receive delight, to receive um, from a healthy caregiver times of peace and quiet together and energetic, glad to be with you. So what's so beautiful about this, Morgan, I think is that what we are learning about humans is that we carry the developmental needs of every age we've ever been. So Stacy opens up you know, the captivating series talking about Madeline Engel's quote, um, we're always every age we've ever been. And um, that's not just a, a cool idea. It's actually physiological. So um, I will always carry that need to receive within me. Um, I never will outgrow that. Now I, I develop new needs and new capacities yes. as I age, but that sort of the needs of the quote-unquote infant or young child within me always remain. And the question is, as an adult, how do I have those needs met in ways that are healthy for me and for others 
or you could say it in ways that don't bring harm yes. to me or other people. So I can't escape my need to receive. And then going back to how how does the infant receive? And the infant receives from this delighted engagement of the caregiver, primarily through the caregiver's face, his or her delighted face reflecting to the infant and engaging the infant. And I think it's profound if we look, for example, even in the blessing that the God of Israel gave to Aaron to bless the people. You know, and he says, the Lord bless you and keep you. He, Lord, make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. That this repetition of the face of God turned toward the people and that receiving the delight of our Father in heaven, our true parent, actually receiving God's gladness to be with you is so central to what is available to us in mm -hmm. the kingdom of God that can redeem all of the impact of sin and loss and devastation in our lives. And um, like you said, we we are the sons of God. Now we have to become the sons mm -hmm. of God. We are the children of God. And now we have to actively receive and become the children of God who can receive the shining face of a father and reattach us to God's self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and friends, this is a really important message for the hour in which we live because the the ultimate war right now is for our attention and our affection, right? That's the frontier. That's what's at stake in a world that's always up, always on, up and to the right, more and more, faster and faster. Our attention and our affection is constantly being asked for by many other things. And so when we talk about the face, it's literally the embodiment of, I am with you, I am present to you. So just even the act of choosing to say no to other things, to give your attention and your affection to God and to the people entrusted to your care. It's a holy act. And what you're saying is it enacts a power beyond our own power, right? The, because the other idea with this, friends, it's so important, is we overemphasize the power of the human will, Absolutely. right? The scriptures say, choose for this day whom you will serve. And there is an enormous power in the will, but it is also insufficient, yes. right? You just look at your New Year's resolutions. Just pause for a minute. Do you, do you even remember what they were? How's that going? right? For most of us, most of them aren't going amazing because we fundamentally seat them in the will mm -hmm. of if I choose, then I will. And to your point, what I want to do, I don't want to do, as Paul says. Why is that? Mm -hmm. But the will is actually meant to be a doorway to open up to the life of God through attachment that empowers us to do the thing we can't do on our own. Right. So friends, this is why this is so important. It's, it's timely for our hour on the earth. It is such a fuel to overcome places where we have lacked breakthrough in our own bodies, in our relationships. And so in the series, we wanna explore what is God's work in restoring secure attachment and we want to offer some practices, some examples, and walk you through the possibility of receiving more of God in this way. And so on this first episode, really, we just want to give an overview, an introduction. And so Sherry, we've been talking about secure attachment. What does it look like or feel like in our bodies, in our life, when we have holes in our attachment, when we have cracks in our foundation, right? When insecure attachment or maternal deprivation is a term that, that is often used when we are lacking sufficient attachment and we're adults, what does that look like? How does that manifest? Let's give a couple stories or examples mm -hmm. of that. And then we can contrast that to secure attachment and offer a little practice mm -hmm. or exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, Morg, I'll, first I'll share from my experience and then I'll share what I've heard other men and women describe in their own bodies. So for me, historically, lack of secure attachment has felt like having an absolutely bewildering and inconsistent minefield of triggers in my body. Mm -hmm. So instead of this stable experience of, I can know in my body reliably, I'm going to experience glad to be with you, that um, joyous, energetic excitement and quiet together in the relationships as I was meant to, I could go from tasting glad to be with you to all of a sudden 
terrified of rejection and literally experiencing abject terror in my body or in its darkest days feeling as if I could actually be, um, like the picture I had was that God was like a spaceship and I could step out the wrong door and just fly away from the mothership and just like cease to exist because I didn't have secure attachment to God, that the universe was not a safe place, that one misstep could cause the whole story to implode and it would have been my fault, something I said or something I chose or something I didn't choose. So this intense anxiety that was just hard to articulate, a constant sense of anxiety if there's danger at any moment and it's going to be because of something I do or say or don't do or don't say that's going to end up with me disconnected from source. And just a deep, deep bodily terror that source was um, not reliable or I wasn't reliably attached to source. Mm. So anxiety for me and, yeah, I would say for me primarily in, in anxiety. How about for you, Morgan? How has, what does attachment feel like for you or lack of secure attachment? You know, sometimes it's actually so close to us that it's hard to find. Mm-hmm. And I, in preparation for this podcast series, I was reflecting on stories that have really moved me over the years of insecure attachment and seeing it manifest in the lives of others. There's one story that comes of a mother of a good friend who grew up on a farm, one of nine children, and there was a lot of neglect in the household. The mom was just overwhelmed. And when she was nine years old, the mom was pregnant with the ninth child. And She was with the mother out in the field and she witnessed her father being crushed by a combine Mm -hmm. and dying in front of her. And she was holding a teddy bear. And in that moment, the trauma of the dad dying actually induced labor in the mom. Mm -hmm. And the mom disappeared that day and never came back. And so in that moment, she lost mom and she lost dad and she was holding a teddy bear. Fast forward, she's now in her 60s, and she has a teddy bear fetish infatuated with collecting teddy bears in every form and fashion. Her house is overwhelmed with teddy bears. So you walk in as a 60-year-old, and you think, what the heck's going on here? A 60-year-old with all these teddy bears. But actually, you can see with compassion that the bear was the closest thing to comfort that attached her soul to the source that she lost. And since that day, she's been trying to get it back. I know a man, and because these really manifest in gender-specific ways, a man that has an inordinate collection of guns. It's a little disturbing, actually, the number of guns this man has. And as I've excavated his story, Uh, It's just terrific damage in the area of uh, insecure attachment with a mother or a father. And in his career, the one place that he found competency was with guns. And actually, it goes another layer beyond competency. It's the one place where he feels something like love. It's a place that he feels value and worth always earned because he's never known unearned love. And so his entire life has been about collecting guns, working on guns, criticizing guns, but they're they're literally his closest companions. And so again, you look at this person and you think, what in the world is this going to be the next mass shooter? But when we explore the, the nuances of their soul's journey, what we see is actually it has everything to do with attachment and where we take it when it's not rooted in the life of God, primarily through that parenting structure that was in design. And so by way of contrast, you know, Sherry, you and I know this has been a big frontier for me over six or so years to really work through secure attachment and let God reparent and repair that place. And so this morning, as an example, Um, I had to get a tire rotation and I was at Discount Tire. And what's interesting is as a younger man, anytime my truck was in the shop, what I would mostly feel inside would be anxiety or disqualification 
or uh, incompetency, inadequacy. I don't know how to work on my vehicle. Or I would feel scarcity. I don't have the money to pay for this, right? My bodily experience of being around a mechanic would have been mostly negative. Now, fast forward over these years of masculine initiation, been led through a process of healing where I've worked with my hands. I've worked on my vehicle. I've learned there's a lot of things now I can do. I have a general competency around my vehicle, but there's things I still can't do. Um, they're outside of my skill set, and there are things I no longer have the time to do because I choose to give time to other things. So I'm in the shop this morning, and it's glass, and I'm watching these guys rotate my tires. And there was just this um, satisfaction. There was a sense of well-being. And the key is it was a deeply spiritual well-being. I could feel my father saying, I got you. I'm taking care of you. Not because you can't rotate your tires, but because the life that I have for you in this season, this is good math to have somebody take 15 minutes and you get to enjoy seeing these other men working on your vehicle because you're giving your strength to other things and other people in this hour. But the importance of that story is that it has everything to do with an internal experience where I'm opening my masculine soul to the father heart of God, experiencing his face shining on my face saying, this is my gift to you this morning. This is not just a service work. I'm actually caring for you through your truck. My face is shining on your face. I'm proud of you for not just muscling through this and rotating your own tires this morning, but actually um, entrusting your vehicle to these men at this stage in your life. And so it's an example of an internal experience where I'm actually in the shop receiving God and experiencing attachment, experiencing that nourishment, that strengthening, and, and it's fortifying me for a world that needs me to offer my strength and sacrificial love. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, Morgan. Beautiful. So, Morgan, I'm curious, you know, as we close this first episode, what would you suggest to our beloved listeners? So, friends, what we're after is the recovery of joy the recovery of well-being, the recovery of a deep peace that is at our center that fuels us regardless of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So as we wrap up this podcast, yeah, Sherry, just one exercise. I took some of the Become Good Soil alumni through this, and it was super helpful. We opened up a shared document, actually, and we started listing unhealthy practices that we use to self-comfort. And it was just a really holy moment of, of disclosure of here's where I turn for comfort, for well-being in a way that it doesn't produce fruit, right? In my story, in this season, this is not serving me. And then in contrast, we tried to articulate where are we receiving comfort that is coming from God, that we are actively opening our heart and our soul to receive secure attachment. And so I wanna invite our listeners as a closing practice to just take a few minutes to pull out a piece of paper and start with three. And let's name what are three unhealthy practices that you are finding. It might be in your life in this season. It might simply be in the last 24 hours, right? It's, it's not exhaustive, but we're looking for an on-ramp. And so what are three unhealthy activities, practices, reaches that you have used to self-comfort apart from God? And Cher, let's just give some examples. I just think of in the last day, I found myself last night at dinner overeating. I was full physically, but I was eating an extra portion because I was looking for some sort of comfort. You know, in another moment yesterday, as I reflect on this, I found myself overly organizing. I was just going through a checklist of everything I had to do. And there was some sense of, if I can just wrangle this thing, if I can just control this thing, because I have too much to do, I will feel better in my body. And they were just godless attempts to recover attachment. What are some examples for mm -hmm. you? 
Yeah, Morgan, I was reflecting. So um, last week, my folks were visiting, and I had a chance to attend with them a virtual service of the church that I grew up in, where the people who you know I knew as a young girl are now in their 70s. And there was a time of fellowship after the service where everyone's faces is on the you know on the Zoom the grid of the Zoom screen and they were asking me what I'm up to and I found myself oversharing and really emphasizing you know this plan I have to go back to graduate school and what I'm going to to do with my degree and sort of my um, speech was hurried and I felt this real compulsion you know my conscious mind is like oh my gosh what am I saying but it was the young girl inside of me I noticed reaching for, do you see me? Do you delight what you, in what you see? Am I worthy? And these are parental type figures who, here I am at 43, these men and women are in their 70s and 80s, and I'm wanting their approval. I'm wanting their faces to shine on me. Mm-hmm. And I'm sharing like I'm a little girl yep. instead of like a 43-year-old woman. Yeah, and in that moment, you use that word compulsive, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's a really important word of what are you, what, what's compulsive? What are you compelled to do? And then you pause and you go, why did I do that? Right. What was motivating me? Exactly. So friends, before we close, I want you to pull out a piece of paper and pick three and just become curious about your own life, students of your life. Where do you reach for comfort apart from God? And then the second piece of this activity are the healthy practices of where can you receive more of God? He is motivated to bring secure attachment to you. Like we've been reflecting on Psalm 23 and says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, when we come to an experiential reality of God as shepherd, we will find we are without lack. We have more than enough. When I was standing in discount tire, not feeling scarcity over the finances, not feeling like I was outsourcing something that I shouldn't be, not feeling scarcity of time. I was actually feeling abundance of the Father's provision that was an actual source of food and fuel for my soul for the things that I do have to face in this week that feel a bit insurmountable. And so some healthy ways of receiving comfort where you can open your heart to God. I'll give, I'll give a few examples and I'd love to hear from you, Sharon. One of the things I've learned is long, warm showers. Mm. I used to be very efficient in my showers because I'm a conservationist and I don't wanna waste and I'm frugal and I don't wanna waste the money. And one of my friends introduced the idea of actually allowing showers to be a place of receiving nourishment from God that it's actually a practice that I do every day. And it's an opportunity to actually receive the life of God. And so I find myself taking longer showers and just invoking the river of life into my body, into my soul, and being saturated with warmth and well-being that whatever else is going on in my life, this moment is a moment of lavish receiving of care. How about you? Example of receiving healthy comfort from Mm -hmm. God to repair insecure attachment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Morgan, one thing that I've been practicing is mentally bringing to mind the faces of the people I love until my body starts responding with that warm feeling of love and then consciously connecting that warm feeling of love to my God. So for um, I was traveling a couple of weeks ago. I was, uh, I traveled to Western Massachusetts and I was away from you and Abigail and Joshua, and I had a four-hour flight each way. And I, I just practiced closing my eyes on the flight and quieting my body and bringing your face to mine, Morgan, and feeling my heart and my body start, you know, literally like is that phrase we have warms our hearts. I can actually feel that sensation. Something around the muscles and the nerve endings in my chest starts to warm. And then staying with that feeling, letting it, continue to grow in my body and then sending that sense of love to my God and and pausing there and letting my body wire around my father is the one who made me for relationship. And my father is the one who's attaching me to his people, setting the lonely in a family, my father and my mother, God. And so 
practicing bringing to mind those things, even if I'm not in actual contact with them, that connect me to the goodness of God, you know, the goodness of God in the land of the living, and then staying with the sensations that brings up in my body, and then actively honing my attention that this goodness is from my good Father, Mm. who is um, faithful to heaven and to earth, faithful to creation, faithful to me. Friends, this is where it gets so fun and so personal. And we just invite you to find your way and recover some treasures that perhaps you experienced at one time and they've been lost along the way. I'm looking at the list of what different men reported when we were doing this exercise. These are some of the things they said. Uh, The healthy exercise of crying when they need to cry. To listen to other guys and the battles and the victories in their stories. Soaking in a hot tub, taking a nap, cleaning something that needs tended to. Deep breathing, drinking water, receiving care from a physical therapist, a morning time by a fireplace or a campfire, warm sunlight on their face, open and honest communication, nature, being immersed in things that are real. Friends, the list is infinite, but we want to invite you to write down a few, recover some treasures, and in this week as we close the first episode of the series on secure attachment, we want to invite you to take an inventory of what is the condition of your attachment to God, not your belief structure, not simply your theology, but your operating relationship with how much you are gazing in the face of God, how much you are receiving affection and delight from God. And what is God inviting you into to repair this place of attachment? to recover your joy, to recover your well-being, and recover a path that you can burst with joy and feel 10 feet tall. So thank you for joining us, and we'll be back for episode two of this series of the Wild Heart Podcast. 